6.05 Eastern Time as Jim Crockett Promotions presents Ric Flair's last match. Everyone will be watching as a 16-time World Heavyweight Champion and cultural icon Ric Flair walks the aisle one final time and teams up with his son-in-law, Andrade El Idolo, to take on WWE Hall of Famer and Nashville wrestling legend Jeff Jarrett and Flair's former training partner Jay Lethal. Limited tickets are still available at rickflairslastmatch.com. And finally, all the weekend's festivities are available worldwide and streaming exclusively on Fight TV. With that, I'll turn the call over to StarCast founder and organizer, Conrad Thompson, for some opening remarks. Then we'll open the floor uh, to take questions. Once the Q&A session begins, I believe you'll be prompted to dial star six to be queued for a question. With that, I will turn the call over to Conrad Thompson. Conrad, are you there? I am, sir. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate the opportunity to come on, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be the biggest StarCast in history. Uh, this is our fifth one, but when I take a look at the lineup of the folks we have there doing meeting greets and certainly the panel discussions, this feels like the most star-studded affair yet. And uh, for the first time ever, StarCast has live wrestling matches, perhaps uh, the hottest independent wrestling company in the game, Game Changer Wrestling. And Boy, does everybody love New Japan Pro Wrestling or what? We're so thankful to have both of those organizations and, of course, Black Label Pro doing their part as well. Uh, the roast should be pretty special. Uh, I've had an opportunity to see uh, some of the folks who weren't able to actually be there in person but send in some videos and it knocked my socks off. I can't wait for folks to see it. Uh, but it's all about Sunday night. Uh, Jim Crockett Promotions, one last time, Rick Flair's last match. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the Forbidden Door, and, and certainly that's an AEW thing, but Man, we have so many organizations represented on this program. I'm just so excited. And uh, it's going to be a big day, not only for David Crockett and Rick Flair, but for wrestling fans. And I appreciate everybody having an interest in it. And there's all the information available over at rickflairslastmatch.com. Uh, the wrestling show will be on satellite, cable, and, of course, Fight TV. And none of this really would have been possible without Fight. Can't thank Mike Weber and the whole team over there enough for all that they've done. And uh, it's taken a, a, a big effort to pull this together, and I've had a lot of help from folks who know a lot more about wrestling than me. And the idea that I'm supposed to be here and answer questions uh, is, is pretty humbling because, man, I couldn't do it without all this great support staff. So with that in mind, Derek, I'd like to open it up for questions and happy to be a resource however I can. Great. Let me open this. Q&A session has started. To ask your question, please press star six. And from the chat conrad um you mentioned the forbidden door how were you able to get so many various promotions to agree to participate in this show well that gives me way too much credit derek it, it implies that, that it had anything to do with me and not everything to do with rick uh rick has accomplished a whole heck of a lot in his near 50 year career and still carries a lot of respect uh, globally you know, within the industry, not just with fans, but the folks who work behind the camera and the mutual offices and the idea that we've got representation from AAA and New Japan. And and uh, certainly there's uh, a lot of other organizations as well. We couldn't do it without MLW and Impact and on and on and on. Uh, and, and if you look hard enough, you'll see some Ring of Honor talent there and some AEW talent there. And it, we're, we're looking to have a who's who and uh, – sort of wrestling without borders, I guess, maybe, you know, some of this stuff shouldn't, uh, shouldn't happen, but somehow it did. And it didn't happen because I was a good salesman. It happened because of Ric Flair's legacy and his contributions to the business. So uh, Ric Flair and David Crockett deserve all the credit for that, but we sure are excited for Sunday night. Follow up to that question. Do you think that this will become more normal with some of these bigger promotions working together, um, seeing that the buzz that this show has received? Well, I mean, listen, I'd love to pat myself on the back and say this was some great new innovation, but the reality is Impact and and uh, and, and AEW were working together, gosh, two years ago. Um, and I think, you know, the, the relationships have really eased up in recent years. I think it's a new era in wrestling. You know, the way things have always been, I think eventually some of these folks started to look around and say, hey, why are we still doing it that way? And the answer was, well, because we always have. And maybe somebody somewhere said, well, what if – and this show is, is really a result of a lot of folks sort of getting on the same page about, yeah, why not? And uh, I'm just proud to be a tiny part of that, but really that credit deserves or, or belongs to these different organizations. I mean, it couldn't happen without, you know, the New Japan office or Dorian and his folks at AAA and, and certainly Scott Demore at Impact and Court Bauer with MLW. And 
and of course Tony Khan and and, and Ring of Honor and, and AEW. So uh, I can't take any credit for that. It's already happened. We're just the most recent iteration, and uh, you know this is a show that was essentially put together by the fans for the fans. You know, as, as a kid, I think a lot of us used to. Maybe some of us did e-feds, or some of us would have like a little figure fed. We'd play with our toys, and what if this guy tagged with that guy? And that was sort of the fun of, of going to the newsstand and seeing some of those wrestling magazines. And what if this guy faced that guy? I mean, we're bringing some of that what if to reality next Sunday night in Nashville. All right, I'm going to try to click this over. Hang tight. It's a three-three number. Uh, go ahead with your question. Uh, hi, Conrad. This is Stephanie from Steelchair Wrestling Magazine in United Kingdom, uh, but I'm calling you from France. Um, how are you today? I'm very well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for this call. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, of course, with COVID, um, StarCast had to pause for three years. Um, nearly three years. Um, during that time, um, did you think that the, some things could evolve? And um, I'm going to say that, um, yeah, the, something maybe changed, and that that starcast would be a, you could make a, an even better starcast that you have have already been before. Made before. Sorry for the. Sorry, but um, yeah. Um, do, do you take the opportunity of the time to to think about uh, Starcast and make it something even better? Well, that's kind of you to say. I appreciate that. I mean, if I'm honest with you, I kind of thought Starcast was in mothballs. You know, the world really changed in March of 2020 with COVID and. It just felt as if, man, when will we get back to normal? And slowly but surely, it does feel like the world has gotten a little more back to normal. But in the meantime, you know, a lot in wrestling has changed. Uh, AEW, who we, you know, really helped, uh, I guess, be sort of their unofficial convention partner for StarCast 2, 3, and 4, uh, they partnered with Turner to start the AEW Fan Fest, which has been just a phenomenal hit and success, and, and it continues to this day. But I was curious, hey, man, can, can meet and greets and, and conventions and things that we've enjoyed sort of pre-COVID exist in this new world? And somehow, some way, we've all persevered and found a way. And I can't say that I had any aspirations to, to think we could do it again. It just felt like it was uh, very unlikely. Uh, but once I saw that, hey, all of a sudden, there's there might be an opportunity in Nashville. It's just two hours from my home. It would be a little easier than some of the other locations we've tried to do it at just logistically. And uh, and when we jumped at the opportunity to put together this event one last time, and, and normally we've tried to center around an AEW weekend, well, it didn't feel as if there was going to be an Access or a WrestleCon or a WrestleCade or any of those great events in Nashville. And with it being two hours away, boy, being the, the serial entrepreneur I am, I couldn't help but think, well, this could be an opportunity. Through a, through a series of what-if conversations, we decided, well, you know, it's not an AEW thing, so we could have wrestling matches. And those what-if type conversations created a, a show for Black Label Pro and Game Changer Wrestling and New Japan. And as I took a look at Sunday and realized, boy, the WWE hopes to have tens of thousands of fans in this stadium on Saturday, and they don't have anything to do on Sunday. What if... And before I knew it, I had commitments from David Crockett and uh, and Ric Flair, and here we are, Ric Flair's last match. It's going to happen next Sunday. I can't believe it. Next question is coming from uh, Dominic. Dominic, I believe your line should be open. Hey, yeah, Conrad, it's Dominic from Podcast Heat uh, at Free Shows in the uh, in Wrestling Inc. So, uh, thanks for having us today. Uh, my question. Uh, I know people are going to be asking about Ric Flair and his last match and everything, but something that's an added cool, very cool element that you acquired was the Jim Crockett Promotions banner. Uh, wanted to see if there was more plans to kind of implement that into like an ongoing, an all-encompassing umbrella almost of maybe independent promotions or further shows down the line with the Jim Crockett Promotions banner underneath it, and then um, more so than just having the brand name and everything like that. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I love the idea of working with David Crockett. If I'm honest with you, Dominic, I don't know that this show would have happened, certainly not the way it would have, had Tony Schiavone and I not revisited 
Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling and Jim Crockett Promotions episodically week by week last year. We broke down 1986, and I, that predates my fandom. So I had seen clips and highlights and best of tapes, but I had never actually had the proper context of what it was really all about. I fell in love with it, and through the course of that uh, series of podcasts we did last year on what happened when with Tony Schiavone, I got to become very good friends with David Crockett. And I could just tell as I spent time with David, man, this guy misses wrestling. He loves wrestling. And I could tell he had the bug. And we would just, you know, hypothesize what if. And when I saw this opportunity the Sunday after SummerSlam, I just thought, well, this could be it. And, and he jumped at the chance as did I. But I knew if we were going to do it, and we, once we sort of landed on the idea of Ric Flair's last match, well, for what promotion? Because you know, we're not really a wrestling promotion. I mean, Dominic, as I'm talking to you now, I'm in my mortgage office. This is my real life. Uh, I, I don't have any aspirations to be a wrestling promoter or to start a promotion. But I thought if Rick's going to have his last match, what better banner to have it under than Jim Crockett Promotions? Uh, so thanks to the help of our gimmick attorney, Mr. Mike Dawkins, he helped us secure uh, the trademark. But I've already told you know David Crockett, come August 1st, uh, I, I'm, I no longer have any interest in the in the Jim Crockett Promotions trademark. That's his family legacy. Uh, his family should own that trademark. And and although technically on paper he and I might be 50-50 on that, he will be 100% owner of Jim Crockett Promotions come August 1st. Uh, I, you know, I appreciate all the buy-in I've had from fans and the different offices, but some of this might have happened because they know that I'm not going to be a wrestling promoter. So, uh, I, I don't have any aspirations of, uh, of of starting a new promotion or, or continuing that banner, but I did think, hey, if, if that trademark is out there, one family should have it, and that's the Crockett family, and, and they'll be 100% completely in control come August 1st, and this is going to be a celebration, Dominic, much like ECW One Night Stand was for me uh, as a, a longtime ECW fan. I jumped at the chance to have that experience and feel the way ECW made me feel one last time, and that's what we tried to do with this docu-series and storytelling. We wanted to make it look and feel like what Jim Crockett Promotions presented in the 80s, just, you know, the 2022 version. So we're doing our best. I hope folks dig it. I hope folks will check it out this Sunday, com. Next question is a 908 number. I believe it's Bill Pritchard. Bill? Hey, how are you guys? We're great, man. Thank you for jumping on. So glad to be on with you, and uh, uh, appreciate you making all the time today. I appreciate you uh, doing this. Uh, I actually had a question about uh, the name itself. I know people kind of joke about wrestling retirements all the time, but this seems like it's a little more final for Rick, uh, maybe for you, I guess, based on your last answer about Starcast. But uh, was there any conversation throughout this process about uh making sure that this was like a one and done it wasn't going to be a few events or maybe even not calling it rick flair's last match maybe having an, another name to it so if you maybe chose to do it again it wasn't you know kind of going back on your word or going back on the event so to speak well, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking that. You know, I, I, I don't consider it going back on my word. You know, uh, bands have farewell tours uh, over and over and over. Now, that's not what we're doing here. Uh, I want to be clear. Uh, Ric Flair's last match is happening in conjunction with StarCast because I saw an opportunity on that Sunday. Had SummerSlam been on a Sunday, I can't say that there would have been a Ric Flair's last match. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, I just look for opportunities. And as a friend of mine says, I just – look for open doors and walk through them. And that's what this was for me. This was a one-off and it's always been a one-off, but I know that Rick has had that bug for a long time. I've been close to Rick for nine years now and occasionally, and I mean, every few months we'd be hanging out and it would just randomly come up. Hey, what if I knew he had that itch? Uh, he probably, uh, and he's been open about this. He regrets wrestling after WrestleMania 24, but what a perfect send off WWE gave him. Uh, with that Shawn Michaels match and then the next night on Monday Night Raw. I mean, that's a send-off that nobody, not just in wrestling, but in sports, gets. Uh, so it was really special. But for a variety of reasons, he did wrestle after that. And unfortunately, his last match was on a soundstage in Orlando, and that's not to disparage anything, but it was just a random TV show. It wasn't a celebration uh, that could anywhere mirror or rival what happened in 2008. 
And I'm not saying that we're going to be able to either, uh, but it does feel like there'll be more of an effort to celebrate his legacy in wrestling with the roast of Ric Flair and that horseman panel that we're calling one last ride for the horseman. And then why not one last match? But in all honesty, I also knew probably shouldn't be a singles match. You know, we want to make sure that Rick looks and feels as close to the nature boy of old as he can. And the way to properly frame that is with a tag match. And I would have liked for the circumstances to be different as to how we get to a tag match and the way this one all sort of was put together. But I, I got to say, I can't lie. I'm pretty proud of the way it's all fell into place. And uh, I'm excited. But to answer your question, no, I, I'm not planning to do a tour. And I know that there's lots of memes out there and there's some, some fun social media accounts that have fun with, oh, this is the first of many, you know, tours of, of Ric Flair's last match or his laster match or his lastest match. And that's all funny stuff. And I understand that. And, and I, I, I love that fans are having fun with it. But the reality is there will not be a, another Ric Flair match with me promoting it. This is Ric Flair's last match. Uh, and, and I know that he has been training and put so much pressure on himself that he's probably realistically not ever going to want to do this again. Uh, Rick does not want to get in there and do what a lot of fans probably expect, which is to chop and strut and woo. He wants to be Ric Flair. And uh, I can't think of a better way to do that with a tag team with, with his son and son-in-law Andrade. And this is Ric Flair's last match guys. Uh, that, there there are no grandiose plans of, you know, at a post-match press conference, we announced we're doing it again next year. And that's, that's just not reality. This is Ric Flair's last match this Sunday, July 31st, municipal auditorium the same building where he beat Randy Savage for the world title, the same building where he ended his trilogy with Steamboat and won the world title. He'll walk that out one last time this Sunday night. Next question goes out to a 954 number. Go ahead. Hey, how are you doing, guys? This is uh, Joey Carney from the Angle Podcast. Uh, first off, I want to say kudos to Conrad, uh, strictly for bringing so many people together and from so many places. It's really what pro wrestling is about, and uh, – it's kind of what we need more of nowadays. Now, being that this year is a little different than the others, uh, because it's more of a family ordeal with Rick's last match, has it been difficult, Conrad, to juggle the roles of kind of a uh, family man and businessman? It's been incredibly difficult, but it's something that I've gotten used to. Uh, you know, I started First Family Mortgage, uh, gosh, i got to think about that, 17 years ago, maybe. Uh, and I, I first got in the mortgage business 21 years ago and slowly but surely recruited you know, my sister to do closing packages, my dad to help originate some loans, my mom to help run some books. I've got a couple of cousins running around here. First Family Mortgage is the real deal. That's my, that's my real life. So I've kind of gotten comfortable with wearing the work hat at work and the family hat at home. Uh, and, but now I've never had to, you know, try to balance that in the professional wrestling realm, not just with, you know, my father-in-law, Rick Flair, but with a broadcast partner and Jeff Jarrett. I mean, Jeff and I had become really, really close and, that relationship is maybe not exactly what we would have hoped it would have been a year ago, but uh, still it, it has been a balancing act where I've got podcasts with both of these folks and I'm in business with both of these folks. And now we're trying to do a wrestling match. And obviously it's very important to Rick because it's his last match, but it's very important to Jeff too, because this is going to be a big spotlight on him and his career as well. I mean, this isn't just something that, that, that Rick is excited about for his legacy. What a footnote in history that's going to be. What a trivia note that's going to be, that Jeff Jarrett is the guy who's standing across from Rick in, in Rick's last match. And, of course, we all expect Jay Lethal and Andrade to go on and continue to have a fabulous career. But realistically, Jeff has a, a full-time day job, and we all know what that is, and we don't have to talk about that here today. But it's not realistic to think that Jeff Jarrett's got all that many matches left either. So he's coming with something to prove, and that has certainly not been something I expected. And uh, I can't wait to see what happens when everybody's in the ring together this Sunday night. We're going to go out to a 773 number. Chicago, go ahead with your question. Hey, Conrad, it's Nick. How's it? Hey, buddy, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. Excited uh, excited you're on the call. Wonderful. Uh, I have a question about a four-way match you are presenting uh, at last match. Uh, that has Jonathan Gresham and Nick Wayne in it. Uh, there was a fightful report uh, that Gresham may not uh, be wanting to wrestle anymore. I was just wondering if he's still booked, if you have any updates on Gresham. And Nick Wayne this morning was reportedly detained 
in Iceland uh, for some kind of bomb threat investigation. I didn't know if you had uh, made contact with Nick and had any update on uh, his status at the moment either. I'll answer the last one first. I'm actually uh, one degree separated from Nick. Uh, I've never actually met Nick in real life. We've had a few text message conversations, but uh, we have a great mutual friend. And I was getting real-time updates yesterday when all of uh, the craziness with his travel schedule was going down. But we do expect him to be in Nashville. Uh, based on everything I've heard, he is safe and sound. And uh, he is ex- as excited about being on Ric Flair's last match card and sharing a, a locker room with Ric Flair as anybody. Uh, so we're looking forward to having Nick. The same goes for Jonathan Gresham. I I haven't spoken to Mr. Gresham since last week. Uh, I did watch the pay-per-view, as I think all of the wrestling world did, Uh, but I haven't had any communication to say that he would not be there. Uh, I'm under the impression that Mr. Gresham will be not only in in the ring come Sunday night, but he'll be doing meet and greets and Starcast, and we can't wait to host him. Uh, I I think it's important to remind everybody that his lovely bride is is in a championship match on our card, and as far as I'm concerned, that's like the co-main event. Uh, not only because the world title is on the line, uh, but because you've got three of the best female wrestlers in the entire world, or let's remove the descriptor. You've got three of the best wrestlers in the world there. So I think it's going to be a family affair in more ways than one, you know, not just the the Ric Flair Andrade connection and and not just the Von Erics and the Briscoes, but my goodness, uh, you've got husband and wife on this card and I'm excited to have them. Let me go out to 914 number. Go ahead with your question, please. Hi, it's uh, Phil Strum from USA Today Network. Thanks for having us. I was wondering, we just. I'm sorry about that. Right. Uh, go ahead again with that question, I'm on, Phil. Yeah, I'm unmuted. It told me I was muted, so I stopped. But uh, I, I noticed in looking at the composition of the Sunday Night Card that children of at least eight of Ric Flair's contemporaries are are booked on that lineup. I was wondering if that was deliberate or if that was a happy accident or <laughs> kind of what the deal was with that. Thank you. It's it's absolutely deliberate. I appreciate you pointing it out. Of course, we're talking about Brian Pillman Jr., Arn Anderson and his son Brock, uh, Ricky Morton and his son Kerry, uh, the British Bulldog son, Davy Boy Smith Jr. Uh, the, the Briscoe brothers are there. Of course, the sons of the Von Erics are of Kevin Von Erich is there. Uh, Fatu, my goodness, his family is, is one of the most famous wrestling families of all. And and then, of course, you've got Jeff Jarrett, who is a, a third-generation promoter, and, and everybody knows what all his dad accomplished, not only out of the ring as a promoter, but in the ring. I think he was in the very first scaffold match. I think he may have created it. Uh, of course, Andrade, multi-generation talent, and, of course, Rick's son-in-law. So, no, it was absolutely intentional. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we were paying – as much tribute and, and and honoring the legacies of professional wrestling, not just today, uh, but of yesteryear, because I think that's what Jim Crockett Promotions is supposed to be about. You know, you go back and, and you take a look at all the great talent that were there. Unfortunately, a lot of those talent are no longer with us, or they're no longer wrestling. But the next best thing would be, let's celebrate the heritage of what wrestling used to be. And so everything with our approach from the sort of old school graphics and the old school music and even the old school storytelling in the docu series, uh, we're trying to have a tip of the cap to the way wrestling used to be. And what better way to do that than to feature some of these multi generation talents? And I can't believe I, I, when I was listing everybody, I forgot Rachel Ellering. My goodness, her father was such a big part of Jim Crockett Promotions. It just feels like we've checked every box. And if you're a Lucha fan, we've got that. You know, that was basically a match of the year candidate, according to Dave Meltzer. We're missing one person uh, who was in that Triple Mania event. Uh, but but the rest of the card, man, it, it's a who's who if you're excited about modern wrestling. But if you're a grandfather and you want to take your son and your grandkid to go see Ric Flair one last time because that's what you grew up on, boy, the, your your grandkid is going to absolutely love these mass superheroes from AAA. And I, I just think this is a multi generational opportunity. And the way to do that and to bring us all together and the, to make us feel the way wrestling used to make us feel is to have some of those names that maybe we don't know this person, but we remember their parents. And and I think a lot of fans are going to be, maybe a lot of lapsed fans are going to be introduced to the current roster of what's possible out there in professional wrestling and be really excited and maybe leap back into their fandom. You know, maybe they, they stopped watching when WCW went down or they stopped watching when Ted Turner bought Jim Crockett promotions. 
but they see what's going on now and they want more of it, boy, that's great for everybody. And uh, I can't wait to see all these multi-generation talent there on Sunday. Let's go out to Scott Fishman. Scott, your question, please. Yep, appreciate it. Um, one other thing, you know, you, you mentioned the undercard, which is incredible, too, as much as the main event. Um, talk about kind of just the role of putting this card together. You mentioned a lot of participants in the matches, but um, kind of leaving it up to, like, how the how you got the input of the different companies on what they want to spotlight or not spotlight, or and then also who might be the point person and kind of helping, you know, put these matches together that we're going to see on Sunday with, you know, there's a lot of expectation. People have high hopes, so... You know, this card is, is incredible on paper, but kind of seeing it play out, um, who kind of would be that person? Please enter. Your input is invalid. You entered one. Please enter your PIN followed by the pound or hash. If you do not know your PIN, please enter pound or hash. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I had become pretty good friends over the last year or so with Scott Demore, and we've been working on some other stuff together. And I jumped at the chance to ask Scott, "Hey, what about?" Uh, and and the same thing with AAA. You know, Conan and, and and Jeff Jarrett have worked a lot with Dorian from AAA, and I became introduced to him uh, over WrestleCon weekend in Dallas. We exchanged uh, contact information and just stayed in touch and talked about some perhaps future business we could do together. And one thing led to another. And it was sort of that same thing up and down the line. Uh, I became, you know, uh, good acquaintances with um, Rocky Romero uh, through through the Good Brothers years ago through their podcast, and I knew that he knew a thing or two about the inner workings of New Japan. And I said, "Hey, man, I see you guys did a show at WrestleCon. Would you like to send a match here for uh, Starcast?" And and we were off to the races. But it wouldn't have happened without the buy-in from from each individual office. Uh, and and I think. You know, the story has been out there for a while, but that I'm pretty friendly with Tony Khan and, and think a lot of what he's doing with AEW. And with his blessing, we were able to, you know, sort of check all the boxes and, and get everything approved. And here we are. Let's go out to uh, Kevin Hellum. Kev, go ahead. Hey, thank you for the time, Conrad. Kevin with SportsKeeda.com. Um, I want to jump right into sure. this. Uh, there's a lot of expectations for StarCast this weekend. It'll stre- it has many different streaming events. I've been to StarCast twice, the first one, the second one in Chicago. You have a lot to offer here, but some people always expect surprises. Now, I'm not expecting you to pull back the curtain on it, but is that no different this year? Uh, I mean, th- there will be surprise videos and cameos for the roast to Ric Flair. Um, I sort of alluded to that earlier. There's a, lo- a whole lot of folks who would love to, to pay respects to Rick and, 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 and be on that stage. But, you know, the entertainment business being what it is, it's just not easy for everyone, especially in a, a summer touring schedule, to, to break away and be here. So the roast will have a lot of surprises. Uh, but the actual panel discussions, I mean, I, could, I know for sure there's going to be a surprise or two in one of those. But uh, by and large, I think the pressure to deliver a surprise exists in a wrestling card. But candidly, you, you do a, a surprise like that if you have a return date. So if we if we said, you know, well, this will lead to that, maybe we could load it up with surprises. But I want to set realistic expectations. Don't expect a bunch of surprises on Sunday. The surprise to me is that we were able to put together 11 matches with all these different promotions. That's the real surprise in my mind. Uh, but, but I would not have an expectation that, oh, there's going to be a big surprise run in from so-and-so. Those type of things usually exist to build to another show, and this is a one-off. So uh, I want to temper expectations. I think you're going to see a whole bunch of great matches. I think everybody's going to try to steal the show. Uh, but in the end, I would not expect – a ton of surprises. And we'll go out to Mr. Jonathan Hood. Mr. Hood, your question, please. Hi, Conrad. I'm Jonathan Hood from Good Karma Wrestling in Chicago. There's an old adage in wrestling that there is usually a wrestler that will build the house, but there's always someone that can steal the show. So I'll ask Conrad, the fan, when you start to see this card build, is there one particular match that you're saying, boy, this could be really good. Maybe something that could seal the show. 
Well, I'll tell you, I think uh, the, the expectations are really high for the AAA match. So people expect it to be great. And longtime fans really expect the Wolves and Guns to steal the show. And if you've been keeping up with what's happening in MLW and Impact, I think, you know, that Josh Alexander, Jacob Fatu match is a dream. So if we're talking sleepers, uh, I got to think that the Von Erics are looking for a big stage. Everybody knows what the Briscoes are capable of. They just saw one of the best tag team matches I've ever seen in my life this past weekend in the main event with the Briscoes and FTR. I think the Von Erics Q&A session is over. Are going to really, really steal the show and impress a lot of folks. Uh, and personally, one of the first matches I jumped to, at the chance to book uh, was Killer Cross and Davey Boy Smith Jr. Uh, I had a chance to see their match at uh, Bloodsport a few years ago. Josh Barnett's phenomenal concept where they sort of do an old school grappling style and remove the ropes. But now, if we could do a rematch in a traditional pro wrestling style match, I think that's going to have a lot of folks talking. So I think the two sleepers of the Von Eric match and the Killer Cross match, in my opinion. And my apologies for hitting that button early on that, Conrad. But I do have one last question here from uh, the chat. Can you talk us through the three-part series put together with Fight? Whose idea was that? Where did the concept come from? Um, Just give us some insight on how that all came together and was delivered. A really great friend of mine came to visit me around Christmas time, and uh, we had a great time catching up. And he told me that he had this idea. Uh, don't you think it's a shame that a lot of professional wrestlers have their last match and don't know it's their last match? You know, they got hired for a new big gig or something happened in their life and they needed to hang up the boots. But a lot of folks just went about their life. This was the way they made their living. And then one day it was just over. Uh, and that felt like a real shame, especially when you consider some of the fabulous send offs that we've seen in traditional sports. Like for instance, Kobe Bryant, you know, he didn't just have a farewell game. He had a farewell season. So every town he visited, people flocked to the arena to go see Kobe Bryant one last time. And I just thought, man, that's a great idea. And then fast forward, when I realized what was happening with with SummerSlam and that there really wasn't anything to do in Nashville on Sunday, I saw that as an opportunity. And I thought, well, I don't really just want to announce a match. And I know that a lot of independent promotions just put up dream matches and then folks get excited about seeing what could happen and what was possible in that dream match. And just having the two names, this guy versus that guy, that sells it. But that didn't really feel on brand for Jim Crockett promotions. You know, I, I wanted a, I wanted to be able to tell a story. I wanted to be able to get lost in a story. I wanted people uh, to be excited about that process. And so we started to think, all right, maybe we should do a docuseries. And, and I heard you reference it as a three-part. Here's a spoiler for you. It's not a three-part. It's a four-part. There will be a final episode that airs after uh, the pay-per-view because I think we need to document what happens as Rick is preparing for his final match, what happens as he's coming to the arena uh, and he's getting ready for that last match, what happens in the match, and how does he feel after the match, and how does everybody else feel after the match. Uh, So I would encourage fans to stay tuned. There will be at least one other episode coming. Uh, It's probably not realistic to think that we'll have that ready the day after. I know typically we've dropped these Mondays at 6.05. I don't think that's realistic. I think we could turn it that quickly. But I do think that Ric Flair's last match is worthy of a story. Uh, Everything that Rick has done in wrestling was about trying to tell a story, whether it was the trilogy with Steamboat or the incredible feud in 89 with Terry Funk, or who could forget the unbelievable series of vignettes that we saw for Starcade 93. I'll never forget just loving Mean Gene coming to Ric Flair's family home as he kisses his family goodbye because it feels as if he's in great danger. And as they get in the back of the limousine and ride into the arena, and and boy, did Neil Pruitt do a great job helping put that whole thing together for WCW. It felt like a big fight feel. So I decided, hey, what if we took that whole concept of maybe a one-off television show about one particular wrestler that sort of explains their last match? What if instead... We did a series, sort of like HBO does or Showtime does before a big fight. I think on HBO they call it 24-7, and on Showtime they call it All Access. But they follow two fighters for a big prize fight as they build towards their collision, and they get a little context for what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they're doing it. So that's what we tried to do with episode one is explain the why. 
Because I know a lot of wrestling fans, when they first saw this announcement, they said to themselves, why is Ric Flair doing this? And I would encourage everyone who still maybe is listening to this or, or reading the recap perhaps to really ask yourself, try to look at it from a different perspective. Not necessarily what you want to see, not necessarily what you think should be done, but see it from Rick's perspective. Ric Flair has entertained us for nearly 50 years in professional wrestling. And if this is important to him and he wants to do it one last time, why would we discourage that? Why would we think that we know better than him? Uh, this is about him wanting to feel like Ric Flair and the Nature Boy one last time. Uh, w w when that whole 2008 retirement happened, that wasn't his idea. He was dictated to. That was created in a creative meeting, and they said, hey, you're having your last match. And by the way, it was fabulous. It was 10 out of 10. But he wasn't necessarily ready to do that, which is why he wrestled again. But at this point, he's been gone for so long, I think everybody understands he's not going to wrestle again. This really is it. But if he wants to feel like Ric Flair and the Nature Boy one last time, having lost his son nearly 10 years ago, and as you saw in episode one, he said, as soon as that happened, he walked across the street to the bar, and he didn't quit drinking for five years. And he nearly lost his life because he was self-medicating, wasn't taking care of himself. But he's worked himself back, and Ric Flair's in a better place mentally, emotionally, physically, financially than I've ever known him right now. This is not a cash grab for Ric Flair. This is not Ric Flair needs a payday. This is about Ric Flair wants the glory and the rush of being in front of a crowd that paid to come see him one last time. And who are we to say that he can't do that? And I understand there are naysayers who have concerns about his health, but they're not his doctor. His doctor has cleared him for it, and his trainer has told him that he's ready. And I just want to remind everybody that this, when he steps through the ropes this Sunday night, it won't be the first time he stepped through the ropes. It'll be the first time you've seen him step through the ropes, but he's been training almost every other day for months. So if there was a concern about something that could happen with Rick medically, it would have already happened in training, candidly, because he's already done it. He's been put through the paces. He's pushed himself. This is not he wants to get out there and chop and strut and woo. He wants to go out there and steal the show. And he's going to have his work cut out for him following guys from AAA and New Japan and MLW and Impact Wrestling and all of these fabulous wrestlers who are here. And in the prime of their career, he feels incredible pressure to deliver. Now, luckily, his tag team partner is one of the best wrestlers in the world today, no matter what anybody says. And they're going to put on one hell of a show this Sunday night. But I would encourage you, if you've been negative and you weren't sure about this and you didn't think he liked it and you don't think he should be doing it, I want you to ask yourself, what about from Rick's perspective? Can I put myself in his shoes and see it from his perspective? And when I see it that way, does it change my opinion? Because here's a spoiler. It's not about you. Not everything in life is about you. And you get to decide if you want to watch it or not. But Ric Flair gets to decide what happens in his life. And if he wants to wrestle one last time and his doctor clears him and his trainer says he's okay and his son-in-law has got his back, Andrade is going to be there to take care of him. And I am ready for what happens Sunday night. Uh, it's going to be uh, a dangerous affair in that main event, but it'll probably be dangerous for Jeff Jarrett, not so much Rick Flair. And with that, we're going to put a bow on it. Conrad, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time today. Uh, media members who joined the call, I want to thank you for joining today's call. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in Nashville. And if you can't join us in person, please remember that start all the uh, StarCast 5 stage shows, wrestling events, and Jim Crockett Promotions Presents the Ric Flair's Last Match are available worldwide and exclusively on Fight TV. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Conrad, thank you for your time.